Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 101 to 104. Chapter 101. The Decanter. Ere the English ship fades from sight, be it set down here that she hailed from London, and was named after the late Samuel Enderby, merchant of that city, the original of the famous whaling house of Enderby and Sons, a house which, in my poor whaleman's opinion, comes not far behind the united royal houses of the Tudors and Bourbons in point of real historical interest. How long, prior to the year of our Lord, 1775, this great whaling-house was in existence, my numerous fish documents do not make plain. But in that year, 1775, it fitted out the first English ships that ever regularly hunted the sperm-whale, though for some score of years previous, ever since 1726, our valiant coffins and macies of Nantucket in the vineyard had in large fleets pursued that leviathan, but only in the north and south Atlantic, not elsewhere. Be it distinctly recorded here that the Nantucketers were the first among mankind to harpoon with civilized steel the great sperm-whale, and that for a half-century they were the only people of the whole globe who so harpooned him. In 1778 a fine ship, the Amelia, fitted out for the express purpose and at the sole charge of the vigorous Enderbys, boldly rounded Cape Horn, and was the first among the nations to lower a whale-boat of any sort in the great South Sea. The voyage was a skilful and lucky one, and returning to her berth with her hold full of the precious sperm, the Amelia's example was soon followed by other ships, English and American, and thus the vast sperm-whale grounds of the Pacific were thrown open. But not content with this good deed, the indefatigable house again bestirred itself. Samuel and all his sons, how many their mother only knows, and under their immediate auspices, and partly, I think, at their expense, the British government was induced to send the sloop-of-war Rattler on a whaling voyage of discovery into the South Seas. Commanded by a naval post-captain, the Rattler made a rattling voyage of it, and did some service, how much does not appear. But this is not all. In 1819 the same house fitted out a discovery whale-ship of their own, to go on a tasting cruise to the remote waters of Japan. That ship, well called the Siren, made a noble experimental cruise, and it was thus that the great Japanese whaling-ground first became generally known. The Siren, in this famous voyage, was commanded by a Captain Coffin, a Nantucketer. All honour to the Enderbys, therefore, whose house, I think, exists to the present day, though doubtless the original Samuel must long ago have slipped his cable for the great South Sea of the other world. The ship named after him was worthy of the honour, being a very fast sailor and a noble craft in every way. I boarded her once at midnight somewhere off the Patagonian coast, and drank good flip down in the forecastle. It was a fine gam we had, and they were all trumps, every soul on board, a short life to them and a jolly death. And that fine gam I had, long, very long after old Ahab touched her planks with his ivory heel, it minds me of the noble, solid Saxon hospitality of that ship, and may my parson forget me and the devil remember me if ever I lose sight of it. Flip? Did I say we had flip? Yes, and we flipped it at the rate of ten gallons the hour, and when the squall came, for it's squally off there by Patagonia, and all hands, visitors and all, were called to reef topsails, we were so top-heavy that we had to swing each other aloft in bowlands, and we ignorantly furled the skirts of our jackets into the sails, so that we hung there, reefed fast in the howling gale, a warning example to all drunken tars. However, the mast did not go overboard, and by and by we scrambled down, so sober that we had to pass the flip again, though the savage salt spray bursting down the forecastle scuttle rather too much diluted and pickled it to my taste. The beef was fine, tough but with body in it. 
They said it was bull beef, others that it was dromedary beef, but I do not know for certain how that was. They had dumplings, too, small but substantial, symmetrically globular, and indestructible dumplings. I fancied you could feel them, and roll them about in you after they were swallowed. If you stooped over too far forward, you risked their pitching out of you like billiard balls. The bread, but that couldn't be helped. Besides, it was an anti-scorbutic. In short, the bread contained the only fresh fare they had. But the forecastle was not very light, and it was very easy to step over into a dark corner when you ate it. But all in all, taking her from truck to helm, Considering the dimensions of the cook's boilers, including his own live parchment boilers, fore and aft, I say, the Samuel Enderby was a jolly ship, of good fare and plenty, fine flip and strong, crack fellows all, and capital from boot heels to hat band. But why was it, think you, that the Samuel Enderby, and some other English whalers I know of, not all, though, were such famous hospitable ships that passed round the beef and the bread and the can and the joke, and were not soon weary of eating and drinking and laughing. I will tell you, the abounding good cheer of these English whalers is a matter for historical research, nor have I been at all sparing of historical whale research when it is seemed needed. The English were preceded in the whale fishery by the Hollanders, Zealanders, and Danes, from whom they derived many terms still extant in the fishery. And what is yet more, their fat old fashions, touching plenty to eat and drink. For, as a general thing, the English merchant ship scrimps her crew, but not so the English whaler. Hence, in the English, this thing of whaling good cheer is not normal and natural, but incidental and particular, and therefore must have some special origin, which is here pointed out, and will be still further elucidated. During my researches in the Leviathanic histories, I stumbled upon an ancient Dutch volume, which, by the musty whaling smell of it, I knew must be about whalers. The title was Dan Koopman, wherefore I concluded that this must be the invaluable memoirs of some Amsterdam cooper in the fishery, as every whale-ship must carry its cooper. I was reinforced in this opinion by seeing that it was the production of one Fitz Swackhammer. But my friend, Dr. Snodhead, a very learned man, professor of low Dutch and high German in the College of Santa Claus and St. Potts, to whom I handed the work for translation, giving him a box of sperm candles for his trouble, this same Dr. Snodhead, so soon as he spied the book, assured me that Dan Koopman did not mean the cooper, but the merchant. In short, this ancient and learned low Dutch book treated of the commerce of Holland, and, among other subjects, contained a very interesting account of its whale fishery. And in this chapter it was, headed smear, or fat, that I found a long, detailed list of the outfits for the larders and cellars of 180 sail of Dutch whalemen, from which list, translated by Dr. Snodhead, I transcribe the following. 400,000 pounds of beef, 60,000 pounds Friesland pork, 150,000 pounds of stockfish, 550,000 pounds of biscuit, 72,000 pounds of soft bread, 2,800 firkins of butter, 20,000 pounds Texel and Leiden cheese, 144,000 pounds cheese, probably an inferior article, 550 anchors of Geneva, 10,800 barrels of beer. Most statistical tables are parchingly dry in the reading. Not so in the present case, however, where the reader is flooded with whole pipes, barrels, quarts, and gills of good gin and good cheer. At the time I devoted three days to the studious digesting of all this beer, beef, and bread, during which many profound thoughts were incidentally suggested to me, capable of a transcendental and platonic application, 
and furthermore I compiled supplementary tables of my own, touching the probable quantity of stockfish, etc., consumed by every low Dutch harpooner in that ancient Greenland and Spitzberg and whale fishery. In the first place, the amount of butter and Texel and Leiden cheese consumed seems amazing. I impute it, though, to their naturally unctuous natures, being rendered still more unctuous by the nature of their vocation, and especially by their pursuing their game in those frigid polar seas, on the very coasts of that Eskimo country where the convivial natives pledge each other in bumpers of train oil. The quantity of beer, too, is very large, 10,800 barrels. Now, as those polar fisheries could only be prosecuted in the short summer of that climate, so that the whole crews of one of these Dutch whalemen, including the short voyage to and from the Spitsbergen Sea, did not much exceed three months, say, and reckoning thirty men to each of their fleet of 180 sail, we have 5,400 low Dutch seamen in all. Therefore, I say, we have precisely two barrels of beer per man for a twelve weeks allowance, exclusive of his fair proportion of that five hundred and fifty anchors of gin. Now, whether these gin and beer harpooners, so fuddled as one might fancy them to have been, were the right sort of men to stand up in a boat's head and take good aim at flying whales, this would seem somewhat improbable. Yet they did aim at them, and hit them too. But this was very far north, be it remembered, where beer agrees well with the constitution. Upon the equator, in our southern fishery, beer would be apt to make the harpooner sleepy at the masthead and boozy in his boat, and grievous loss might ensue to Nantucket and New Bedford. But no more. Enough has been said to show that the old Dutch whalers of two or three centuries ago were high livers and that the English whalers have not neglected so excellent an example. For, say they, when cruising in an empty ship, if you can get nothing better out of the world, get a good dinner out of it at least. And this empties the decanter. Chapter 102 A Bower in the Arsacides Hitherto, in descriptively treating of the sperm whale, I have chiefly dwelt upon the marvels of his outer aspect, or, separately and in detail, upon some few interior structural features. But to a large and thorough sweeping comprehension of him, it behooves me now to unbutton him still further, and, untagging the points of his hose, unbuckling his garters, and casting loose the hooks and eyes of the joints of his innermost bones, set him before you in his ultimatum, that is to say, in his unconditional skeleton. But how now, Ishmael? How is it that you, a mere oarsman in the fishery, pretend to know aught about the subterranean parts of the whale? Did erudite stub mounted upon your capstan deliver lectures on the anatomy of the cetacea, and by help of the windlass hold up a specimen rib for exhibition? Explain thyself, Ishmael. Can you land a full-grown whale on your deck for examination, as a cook dishes a roast pig? Surely not. A veritable witness have you hitherto been, Ishmael, but have a care how you seize the privilege of Jonah alone, the privilege of discoursing upon the joists and beams, the rafters, ridgepoles, sleepers, and underpinnings, making up the framework of the Leviathan and be like of the tallow-vats, dairy-rooms, butteries, and cheeseries in his bowels. I confess that since Jonah few whalemen have penetrated very far beneath the skin of the adult whale. Nevertheless I have been blessed with an opportunity to dissect him in miniature. In a ship I belonged to, a small cub sperm-whale was once bodily hoisted to the deck for his poke, or bag, to make sheaths for the barbs of the harpoons, and for the heads of the lances. Think you I let that chance go, without using my boat-hatchet and jack-knife, and breaking the seal, and reading all the contents of that young cub? And as for my exact knowledge of the bones of the leviathan in their gigantic, full-grown development, for that rare knowledge I am indebted to my late royal friend Tranquo, king of Tranc, one of the Arsacides. 
For being at Trank, years ago, when attached to the trading ship Day of Algiers, I was invited to spend part of the Arsacidean holidays with the Lord of Trank at his retired palm villa at Pupella, a seaside glen not very far distant from what our sailors called Bamboo Town, his capital. Among many other fine qualities, my royal friend Tranquo, being gifted with a devout love for all matters of barbaric vertu, had brought together in Pupella whatever rare things the more ingenious of his people could invent, chiefly carved woods of wonderful devices, chiseled shells, inlaid spears, costly paddles, aromatic canoes, and all these distributed among whatever natural wonders the wonder-freighted, tribute-rendering waves had cast upon his shores. Chief among the latter was a great sperm-whale, which, after an unusually long, raging gale, had been found dead and stranded, with his head against a coconut tree, whose plumage-like tufted droopings seemed his verdant jet. When the vast body had at last been stripped of its fathom-deep enfoldings, and the bones became dust-dry in the sun, then the skeleton was carefully transported up the Pupella Glen, where a grand temple of lordly palms now sheltered it. The ribs were hung with trophies, the vertebrae were carved with Arsacidean annals, in strange hieroglyphics, in the skull the priests kept up an unextinguished aromatic flame, so that the mystic head again sent forth its vapory spout, while, suspended from a bough, the terrific lower jaw vibrated over all the devotees, like the hair-hung sword that so affrighted Damocles. It was a wondrous sight. The wood was green as mosses of the icy glen. The trees stood high and haughty, feeling their living sap. The industrious earth beneath was as a weaver's loom, with a gorgeous carpet on it, whereof the ground-vine tendrils formed the warp and woof, and the living flowers the figures. All the trees, with all their laden branches, all the shrubs and ferns and grasses, the message-carrying air, all these unceasingly were active. Through the lacings of the leaves the great sun seemed a flying shuttle, weaving the unwearied verdure. O oh, busy weaver, unseen weaver, pause, one word, whither flows the fabric, what palace may it deck, wherefore all these ceaseless toilings, speak, weaver, stay thy hand, but one single word with thee. Nay, the shuttle flies, the figures float from forth the loom, the freshet rushing carpet forever slides away, the weaver god, he weaves, and by that weaving is he deafened, that he hears no mortal voice. And by that humming, we too who look on the loom are deafened, and only when we escape it shall we hear the thousand voices that speak through it. For even so it is in all material factories, the spoken words that are inaudible among the flying spindles, those same words are plainly heard without the walls, bursting from the opened casements. Thereby have villainies been detected. Ah, mortal, then be heedful, for so in all this din of the great world's loom thy subtlest thinkings may be overheard afar. Now amid the green, life-restless loom of that Arsacidean wood, the great, white, worshipped skeleton lay lounging, a gigantic idler, Yet, as the ever-woven, verdant warp and woof intermixed and hummed around him, the mighty idler seemed the cunning weaver, himself all woven over with the vines, every month assuming greener, fresher verdure, but himself a skeleton. Life folded death, death trellised life, the grim god wived with youthful life, and begat him curly-headed glories. Now when with the royal Tranquo I visited this wondrous whale, and saw the skull and altar and the artificial smoke ascending from where the real jet had issued, I marveled that the king should regard a chapel as an object of vertu. He laughed. But more I marveled that the priest should swear that smoky jet of his was genuine. To and fro I paced before this skeleton, brushed the vines aside, broke through the ribs, 
and with a ball of Arsacidean twine, wandered, eddied long amid its many winding, shaded colonnades and arbors. But soon my line was out, and following it back, I emerged from the opening where I entered. I saw no living thing within. Naught was there but bones." Cutting me a green measuring rod, I once more dived within the skeleton. From their arrow slit in the skull, the priests perceived me taking the altitude of the final rib. How now, they shouted, darest thou measure this, our god? That's for us. Aye, priests, well, how long do you make him, then? But hereupon a fierce contest rose among them, concerning feet and inches. They cracked each other's sconces with their yardsticks. The great skull echoed, and, seizing that lucky chance, I quickly concluded my own admeasurements. These admeasurements I now propose to set before you. But first be it recorded that, in this matter, I am not free to utter any fancied measurement I please, because there are skeleton authorities you can refer to to test my accuracy. There is a Leviathanic Museum, they tell me, in Hull, England, one of the whaling ports of that country, where they have some fine specimens of finbacks and other whales. Likewise I have heard that in the Museum of Manchester in New Hampshire, they have what the proprietors call, quote, the only perfect specimen of a Greenland or river whale in the United States, end quote. Moreover, at a place in Yorkshire, England, Burton Constable by name, a certain Sir Clifford Constable has in his possession the skeleton of a sperm whale, but of moderate size, by no means of the full-grown magnitude of my friend King Tranquo's. In both cases the stranded whales to which these two skeletons belonged were originally claimed by their proprietors upon similar grounds, King Tranquo seizing his because he wanted it, and Sir Clifford because he was lord of the seigneuries in those parts. Sir Clifford's whale has been articulated throughout, so that like a great chest of drawers, you can open and shut him in all of his bony cavities, spread out his ribs like a gigantic fan, and swing all day upon his lower jaw. Locks are to be put upon some of his trap-doors and shutters, and a footman will show round future visitors with a bunch of keys at his side. Sir Clifford thinks of charging tuppence for a peep at the whispering gallery in the spinal column, threepence to hear the echo of the hollow of his cerebellum, and sixpence for the unrivalled view from his forehead. The skeleton dimensions I shall now proceed to set down are copied verbatim from my right arm, where I had them tattooed, as in my wild wanderings at that period there was no other secure way of preserving such valuable statistics, but as I was crowded for space, and wished the other parts of my body to remain a blank page for a poem I was then composing, at least what untattooed parts might remain, I did not trouble myself with the odd inches, nor indeed should inches at all enter into a congenial ad measurement of the whale. Chapter 103. Measurement of the Whale's Skeleton In the first place, I wish to lay before you a particular plain statement touching the living bulk of this leviathan, whose skeleton we are briefly to exhibit. Such a statement may prove useful here. According to a careful calculation I have made, and which I partly base upon Captain Scoresby's estimate of seventy tons for the largest size Greenland whale of sixty feet in length, according to my careful calculation, I say, a sperm whale of the largest magnitude, between eighty-five and ninety feet in length, and something less than forty feet in its fullest circumference, such a whale will weigh at least ninety tons, so that reckoning thirteen men to a ton, he would considerably outweigh the combined population of a whole village of one thousand one hundred inhabitants. Think you not, then, that brains like yoked cattle should be put to this leviathan, to make him at all budge to any landsman's imagination? Having already in various ways put before you his skull, spout-hole, jaw, teeth, tail, forehead, fins, and diverse other parts, 
I shall now simply point out what is most interesting in the general bulk of his unobstructed bones. But as the colossal skull embraces so very large a proportion of the entire extent of the skeleton, as it is by far the most complicated part, and as nothing is to be repeated concerning it in this chapter, you must not fail to carry it in your mind, or under your arm, as we proceed, otherwise you will not gain a complete notion of the general structure we are about to view. In length the sperm whale's skeleton at Trank measured seventy-two feet, so that when fully invested and extended in life he must have been ninety feet long, for in the whale the skeleton loses about one-fifth in length compared with the living body. Of this seventy-two feet, his skull and jaw comprised some twenty feet, leaving some fifty feet of plain backbone. Attached to this backbone, for something less than a third of its length, was the mighty circular basket of ribs which once enclosed his vitals. To me this vast ivory-ribbed chest, with the long unrelieved spine, extending far away from it in a straight line, not a little resembled the hull of a great ship new laid upon the stocks, when only some twenty of her naked bow-ribs are inserted, and the keel is otherwise, for the time, but a long disconnected timber. The ribs were ten on a side. The first, to begin from the neck, was nearly six feet long, the second, third, and fourth were each successively longer, till you came to the climax of the fifth, or one of the middle ribs, which measured eight feet and some inches. From that part the remaining ribs diminished, till the tenth and last only spanned five feet and some inches. In general thickness they all bore a seemly correspondence to their length, the middle ribs were the most arched. In some of the Arsacides they are used for beams, whereon to lay footpath bridges over small streams. In considering these ribs I could not but be struck anew with the circumstance, so variously repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale is by no means the mould of his invested form. The largest of the trank ribs, one of the middle ones, occupied that part of the fish which, in life, is greatest in depth. Now the greatest depth of the invested body of this particular whale must have been at least sixteen feet, whereas the corresponding rib measured but little more than eight feet, so that this rib only conveyed half of the true notion of the living magnitude of that part. Besides, for some way, where I now saw but a naked spine, all that had been once wrapped round with tons of added bulk in flesh, muscle, blood, and bowels. Still more, for the ample fins, I here saw but a few disordered joints, and, in place of the weighty and majestic, but boneless flukes, an utter blank. How vain and foolish, then, thought I, for timid, untravelled man to try to comprehend aright this wondrous wail by merely poring over his dead, attenuated skeleton, stretched in this peaceful wood. No, only in the heart of quickest perils, only when within the eddyings of his angry flukes, only on the profound, unbounded sea can the fully invested whale be truly and livingly found out but the spine, for that the best way we can consider it is, with a crane, to pile its bones high up on end. No speedy enterprise, but now it's done, it looks much like Pompey's pillar. There are forty and odd vertebrae in all, which in the skeleton are not locked together. They mostly lie like the great knobbed blocks on a gothic spire, forming solid courses of heavy masonry. The largest, a middle one, is in width something less than three feet, and in depth more than four. The smallest, where the spine tapers away into the tail, is only two inches in width, and looks something like a white billiard ball. I was told that there were still smaller ones, but that they had been lost by some little cannibal urchins, the priest's children, who had stolen them to play marbles with. Thus we see how that the spine of even the hugest of living things tapers off at last into simple child's play. Chapter 104 The Fossil Whale 
From his mighty bulk, the whale affords a most congenial theme whereon to enlarge, amplify, and generally expatiate. Would you, you could not compress him. By good rights he should only be treated of in imperial folio. Not to tell over again his furlongs from spiracle to tail, and the yards he measures about the waist, only think of the gigantic involutions of his intestines, where they lie in him like great cables and hawsers coiled away in the subterranean orlop deck of a line of battleship. Since I have undertaken to manhandle this leviathan, it behooves me to approve myself omnisciently exhaustive in the enterprise, not overlooking the minutest seminal germs of his blood, and spinning him out to the uttermost coil of his bowels. Having already described him in most of his present habitatory and anatomical peculiarities, it now remains to magnify him in an archaeological, fossiliferous, and antediluvian point of view. Applied to any other creature than the leviathan, to an ant or a flea, such portly terms might justly be deemed unwarrantably grandiloquent. But when leviathan is the text, the case is altered. Fain am I to stagger to this emprise under the weightiest words of the dictionary. And here be it said, that whenever it has been convenient to consult one in the course of these dissertations, I have invariably used a huge quarto edition of Johnson, expressly purchased for that purpose, because that famous lexicographer's uncommon personal bulk more than fitted him to compile a lexicon to be used by a whale author like me. One often hears of writers that rise and swell with their subject, though it may seem but an ordinary one. How then with me writing of this leviathan? Unconsciously my chirography expands into placard capitals. Give me a condor's quill. Give me Vesuvius's crater for an inkstand. Friends, hold my arms. For in the mere act of penning my thoughts of this leviathan, they weary me, and make me faint with their outreaching comprehensiveness of sweep, as if to include the whole circle of the sciences, and all the generations of whales, and men, and mastodons, past, present, and to come, with all the revolving panoramas of empire on earth, and throughout the whole universe, not excluding its suburbs. Such and so magnifying is the virtue of a large and liberal theme. We expand to its bulk. To produce a mighty book, you must choose a mighty theme. No great and enduring volume can ever be written on the flea, though many there be who have tried it. Ere entering upon the subject of fossil whales, I present my credentials as a geologist, by stating that in my miscellaneous time I have been a stonemason, and also a great digger of ditches, canals, and wells, wine vaults, and cellars, and cisterns of all sorts. Likewise, by way of preliminary, I desire to remind the reader that while in the earlier geological strata there are found fossils of monsters now almost completely extinct, the subsequent relics discovered in what are called the tertiary formations seem the connecting, or at any rate intercepted, links between the antichronical creatures and those whose remote posterity are said to have entered the ark. All the fossil whales hitherto discovered belong to the tertiary period, which is the last preceding the superficial formations. And, though none of them precisely answer to any known species of the present time, they are yet sufficiently akin to them in general respects to justify their taking rank as cetacean fossils. Detached broken fossils of pre-Adamite whales, fragments of their bones and skeletons, have within thirty years past, at various intervals, been found at the base of the Alps, in Lombardy, in France, in England, in Scotland, and in the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Among the more curious of such remains is part of a skull, which in the year 1779 was disinterred in the Rue Dauphin in Paris, a short street opening almost directly upon the palace of the Tuileries, and bones disinterred in excavating the great docks of Antwerp in Napoleon's time. Cuvier pronounced these fragments to have belonged to some utterly unknown leviathanic species. 
but by far the most wonderful of all cetacean relics was the almost complete vast skeleton of an extinct monster found in the year 1842 on the plantation of Judge Cree in Alabama. The awe-stricken, credulous slaves in the vicinity took it for the bones of one of the fallen angels. The Alabama doctors declared it a huge reptile, and bestowed upon it the name of Basilosaurus. But some specimen bones of it being taken across the sea to Owen, the English anatomist, it turned out that this alleged reptile was a whale, though of a departed species. A significant illustration of the fact, again and again repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale furnishes but little clue to the shape of his fully invested body. So Owen rechristened the monster Zuglodon, and in his paper, read before the London Geological Society, pronounced it in substance one of the most extraordinary creatures which the mutations of the globe have blotted out of existence. When I stand among these mighty leviathan skeletons, skulls, tusks, jaws, ribs, and vertebrae, all characterized by partial resemblances to the existing breeds of sea monsters, but at the same time bearing, on the other hand, similar affinities to the annihilated anti-chronical leviathans, their incalculable seniors, I am, by a flood, borne back to that wondrous period, ere time itself can be said to have begun, for time began with man. Here Saturn's grey chaos rolls over me, and I obtain dim, shuddering glimpses into those polar eternities, when wedged bastions of ice pressed hard upon what are now the tropics, and in all the twenty-five thousand miles of this world's circumference, not an inhabitable hand's breadth of land was visible. Then the whole world was the whales, and, king of creation, he left his wake along the present lines of the Andes and the Himalayas. Who can show a pedigree like Leviathan? Ahab's harpoon had shed older blood than the pharaohs. Methuselah seems a schoolboy. I look round to shake hands with Shem. I am horror-struck at this anti-mosaic, unsourced existence of the unspeakable terrors of the whale, which, having been before all time, must needs exist after all humane ages are over. But not alone has this leviathan left his pre-Adamite traces in the stereotype plates of nature, and in limestone and marl bequeathed his ancient bust, but upon Egyptian tablets, whose antiquity seems to claim for them an almost fossiliferous character, we find the unmistakable print of his fin. In an apartment of the great temple of Dendera, some fifty years ago, there was discovered upon the granite ceiling a sculptured and painted planisphere abounding in centaurs, griffins, and dolphins, similar to the grotesque figures on the celestial globe of the moderns. Gliding among them, old leviathans swam as of yore, was there swimming in that planisphere centuries before Solomon was cradled. Nor must there be omitted another strange attestation of the antiquity of the whale, in his own osseous post-diluvian reality, as set down by the venerable John Leo, the old Barbary traveller. Not far from the seaside they have a temple, the rafters and beams of which are made of whale bones, for whales of a monstrous size are oftentimes cast up dead upon that shore. The common people imagine that by a secret power bestowed by God upon the temple, no whale can pass it without immediate death. But the truth of the matter is that on either side of the temple there are rocks that shoot two miles into the sea, and wound the whales when they light upon them. They keep a whale's rib of an incredible length for a miracle, which lying upon the ground with its convex part uppermost makes an arch, the head of which cannot be reached by a man upon a camel's back. This rib, says John Leo, is said to have lain there a hundred years before I saw it. Their historians affirm that a prophet who prophesied of Mahomet came from this temple, and some do not stand to assert that the prophet Jonas was cast forth by the whale at the base of the temple. End quote. In this Afric temple of the whale I leave you, reader, and if you be a Nantucketer and a whaleman, you will silently worship there. 
End of chapters 101 to 104.